what to do when the finances are in a mess. Now, I don't mean you can't figure out how to balance your checkbook. That's not the kind of mess I'm referred to that can be overcome. But I mean, it's so easy nowadays to fall into the trap and you end up with bills you can't pay, no money in the bank, everybody's unhappy, blaming each other. The only option seems to be put more on the credit card and the bills keep getting bigger. People live from paycheck to paycheck and they can't miss a day's work because that would be disaster. Heard on the news the other day that uh, they said this past year in America, the average person spent 1% more than they made. Well, that's not a big amount, but that still means uh, that uh, they have less and less money and are in more and more financial trouble. Uh, the average credit card balance, they also said on that news item, the average balance on the average credit card is $9,000. And I read this, uh, heard just a snatch this morning uh, or last night that baby boomers, that generation, uh, a large percentage of them are supporting their adult children, which means there are a lot of young adults who can't make, make it on their own and have to be supported by their parents. And uh, so we have all these loan companies advertising and offering you to combine all your debts and let us refinance them. We will. Uh, consolidate all your bills and give you a hundred percent loan on your house and uh, take care of those bills for you and you can have some cash left over and then eventually they can uh, walk away with your house probably. Uh, well, some people I imagine this weekend have put themselves in debt for the next two years so they can go to the Super Bowl. And others would say, well, we'll buy a lottery ticket because I'm so such bad shape that the only way I can make it is to win the lottery and pay my debts. And instead of winning anything, the debts get bigger and bigger. Uh, so there's just a lot of people in this world, and the number is getting larger all the time. A lot of people where their finances are in a mess. And when finances are in a mess, then there are other problems. There's tension. There's worry. Headaches frustration and anger. Now, there's nothing wrong with being poor, uh, not having much to live on, uh, just uh, kind of barely getting by. Uh, I lived that way for many years. Uh, but when you're in debt and can't pay the bills, that's a miserable mess. And that's not the way God wants it to be. Now, there's a better way to live than that. And so I'd like us to consider uh, from the scriptures some principles this morning. Take your Bibles and turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6, where the Apostle Paul gives us some facts about money and how to deal with it. Trust you have a note sheet. You might jot these down and give them a little thought as we find them here in the Scriptures. So the first comment that the Apostle makes shows us that money is temporary. Money is temporary. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 7. Paul says this, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. That is, whatever money we have, it doesn't last. It's temporary. I like that verse back in Proverbs. It says, money is like uh, an eagle. It grows wings and flies away. Maybe you've seen that happen with some of your money. It does that. Uh, we entered this life without a penny to our name. And we'll leave it the same way, no matter how much you accumulate in between times. And even during life, when you think you're going to get ahead, then something happens, car breaks down, kids get sick, extra is all gone. And so we need to see it that way, that money is a temporary thing. Uh, they, there is a certain form of paper matter they call securities. You know, you can buy these securities, invest in these securities. That's quite a name, security. Uh, I've seen enough of those securities to know there's nothing secure about them at all. And the uh, securities aren't very secure. Money is temporary. Remember Enron? All kinds of people had a fortune invested in it. And in a week, it was gone. Money is a temporary commodity. No matter how much you have, it will all be gone sooner or later, generally sooner, but sooner or later it will all be gone. 
And when you leave this world, you'll not take it with you. Didn't have any when you came, won't have any when you leave. Money is temporary, just with us for a little while. Now there's a second principle in this passage uh, about money, and that is money does not satisfy. Money does not satisfy. Verse 8, Paul says, Having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. Be satisfied if you have food to eat and shelter for your body, a clothing place to live. If you have that, be satisfied with that. But money won't bring you satisfaction at all. Now, how much money do we want? How much money do we need? Story told to someone asking a rich man, how much money would it take for you? He's got millions of dollars. Somebody asked him, how much money would it take for you to be satisfied? He said, just a little bit more. No matter how much you have, you always need more, always want more. And people think if they have the money to buy everything, got all the money I need to buy all the things I want, then I will be satisfied. But you know, things never satisfy anybody. Now, if you have the basic needs, you can be content. If God gives you more, that's fine. If he doesn't, that's all right as well. Uh, but if you have food and shelter, that's all you really need. But the problem is, we are bombarded with the advertising industry convincing us that we need things we don't need. Tonight on the Super Bowl, that is tonight in case you've forgotten, uh, on the Super Bowl, uh, advertisers will spend $2.6 million for 30 seconds of advertising time. You say, why would they throw away that much money? Because they're convinced that if they, and they know what they're doing, if they spend $2.6 million advertising Tostitos or something, uh, you'll buy them, enough to pay for that $2.6 million. In other words, they can convince you that you need something, which will probably kill you eventually anyhow, uh, but uh, uh, convince you that you need, so uh, you need something which you don't really need. Now, the problem with many people is they have easy credit. It's so easy to buy things. You can get rugs for your house. You don't have to pay them a penny for two years, they say. And whatever you need, you can put it on your credit card. You can buy anything and pay them 18% interest or something on it as well. And uh, uh, they don't want you to pay for it. They make more money on the interest than they do on the profit on the item that they are selling you. But it's so easy to get things, to buy things. Uh, it used to be there was a time when people would say, Oh, I can't afford that. I can't afford something. I don't hear that much anymore. Nowadays, if we want it, we buy it. Because there's the credit card. And we can buy it if we want it. And if you don't have, uh, we need to understand the principle. Uh, if you don't have money, money free to pay for it, that means you can't afford it. And so you don't buy it. But people have no self-control or very little self-control. And many have no self-control at all. And if I want something, then I should be able to get it. If my children want something, they should have it. We can't say no to ourselves or to our children or to anybody else. Now, you know, God promises in the scriptures, my God shall provide all your needs. And he does that. The credit card company promises they will provide all your wants. But no matter how many wants of yours they supply, you will still want something else. Uh, a credit card uh, is not bad if you pay it off every month. But if you don't, if you are buying things you can't pay for at the end of the month, that means you are wasting money and in the interest you're going to pay them, and you are courting disaster because those things tend to keep growing. And the biggest source of family problems today in America is problems caused by the credit card. People buying things they can't afford to buy. And you should have a principle in your life to never use a credit card to buy something you can't pay for. Yeah, if you've got money in the bank to pay for it, and it's free in your budget, uh, and you think you need this thing, then buy it and pay for it at the end of the month. But we ought to be satisfied with what we can afford. We ought to learn to be satisfied with, and make do with what God has provided us with and be satisfied with what God gives us instead of just charging it 
so we can have more. Well, let's understand that money, no matter what you buy, no matter how big your credit card balances are, you will still never be satisfied because we always want more. Money will not satisfy you, and charging it will not satisfy you either. Now, there's a third principle we ought to consider, and that is that money is dangerous. I didn't say money is bad, but it's dangerous. Look at chapter 6, verse 9. They that will be rich, those who, who want more and more money or more and more things, fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. Those who want things, more money or things I can buy with money, oh, he says they fall into a snare, into dangerous lusts. Well, money is dangerous. And let me just outline some of the dangers that come with money or longing for money or for things. First of all, uh, money is deceitful. In the book of Matthew, chapter 13, Jesus is telling the parable of the sower and the seed and uh, the different results. Matthew, chapter 13, verse 22, uh, he says this. Remember some of the, he sowed the seed and some of the seed sprang up and then it was choked out by the thorns and thistles. He says in verse 22, he also that receives seed among the thorns, this is he, that heareth the word and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becometh unfruitful. A person's life may become unfruitful because of the deceitfulness of riches. Riches are deceitful. That means they will trick you. They will fool you. Uh, riches will tell you, or this philosophy of having more, uh, will tell you that money will make you happy. Money will solve all your problems. If you just had more money, your problems would go away. Uh, if you just had more money, you would be happy. Well, you know, that's just not true. That's a lie. Now, you've all read in the paper, I assume, uh, accounts of these different folk who've won the lottery, millions of dollars. There's one man out in West Virginia, 200 and some millions of dollars. And then read what happens to those people. And the better share of them, their life ends up in complete misery. That man lost everything, his business, his family, his favorite granddaughter, and all the rest because of those riches. Riches uh, can often do much more harm than they do good. And uh, he says in this verse, watch out, uh, because they lead you into temptation and a snare and many foolish lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. They are deceitful. Think of people in the Bible destroyed by the love of money. Back in the book of Joshua, there was that man Achan who saw that gold and that silver and those garments. He would just take them for himself. He'd be rich and happy the rest of his life. He ended up losing his life and the life of his family. A Gehazi, that servant of the prophet, who said, oh, he didn't take any money from Naaman for healing him of his leprosy. I'll go get some. And he went and got some. And he came back. His master said, Gehazi, the leprosy of Naaman is going to be attached to you. And he was a leper from that day till the day of his death. Life ruined by desire for money. Or Balaam, remember Balaam. His desire to get that money from Balak. And, and oh, how he longed for a household of gold and silver as he uh, envisioned and he got the gold and silver and shortly lost his life, ruined him. Judas, selling his master for a few pieces of silver and ended up a suicide in an eternal hell because of his love for money. Ananias and Sapphira in the New Testament are lying about what they'd given, trying to make themselves look important and hang on to their money at the same time, both of them losing their life because of it. Oh, money is dangerous. Drowns men in perdition. It's a snare. And so easy to be deceived by money. And to think if we just had more, everything would be all right. But it's not so. The love of money destroys. Now secondly, second problem with money is it gives a false measure of life. It gives a false measure of life. I turn back to Luke chapter 12, verse 15. Luke 12, verse 15. Jesus says, 
Take heed and beware of covetousness, that is, wanting money, wanting things. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of things which he possesses. Don't measure your life by how much money, how many things you have. That's a false measure. Oh, so many people think their life is measured by what they have. Oh, this is what life's all about, having money, having things, a big house, a fancy car, and all those things. And if I have a lot of stuff, I'm living the good life. But you know, that's not the way you measure life. You measure life by peace in your heart and meaningful purpose to the way you live and where you're going to spend eternity. That's how to measure your life, not by how many things you have. The measure of your life is not what you have. The third problem with money is it gives you a false sense of security. In that same chapter in Luke, Luke chapter 12, uh, Jesus told the story of the rich fool who had a great crop and he was prospering and no, his crops were so good he didn't know what to do. He had so much stuff coming in and he decided this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones and I'll store up all these crops and I'll have plenty to live for many years. I can say to myself, take it easy, retire, live it up, live large, live the good life because now you'll have so much money. And I notice in chapter 12 verse 20 it says God said unto him thou fool this night thy soul shall be required of thee then who shall those things be which thou hast provided so you're a fool you've got a big bank account but tonight you're going to die and it won't do you any good at all money is not the way you measure your life money gives you a false sense of security that man thought he had it made he thought he had everything going his way and he was going to really enjoy life now because he had so much no security there at all that night, he went into a lost eternity. There's another danger of money. It enslaves people, makes a slave of people. In Luke chapter 16, verse 13, Luke chapter 16, verse 13, Jesus said, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Have to work for this master or that master. So he says, if you want to live for money, you can't live for God. If you want to live for God, you can't live for money. You can't serve God and money. But money will encourage you to serve money. Live for money. Live for things. And it enslaves people. You know, a lot of people are slaves to their money. They may not have any, but they're slaves to money, making more, uh, keeping track of their investments. No time for God. No time for their family. They're busy making money. And in Luke chapter 16, verse 13, I notice what Jesus says here, Luke 16, verse 13. It says, can't serve two masters, one or the other. If you live for money, if all your life is wrapped up in making money and getting things, buying things and that sort of thing, uh, money is your master, you're a slave to your money. Fifth danger of money, money often makes people thieves. Money often makes people sleep, uh, thieves. They become slaves to debt, and then they buy and spend and don't pay their bills. That means they're a thief, taking people others' money. If you don't pay your bills, you're a thief. Pay your bills when you're supposed to pay them on time, you're a thief, a robber. And uh, people also become thieves by not tithing. So love their money, they're so attached to their money, they just need their money so much they can't give God what it is. The tithe of our money belongs to the Lord. It's not ours, it's God's. And if we don't give it to him, if we take what is God's and keep it for ourselves, that means we're a thief. Now, Matthew 3.8, he says, uh, people say, or God says, you've robbed me. And the people say, how have we robbed God? He says, by taking the tithes and not giving them to me, keeping them for yourself, you're a thief. Well, uh, that's not good to be a thief. You know, the best way I know of for anyone to get out of debt is to start tithing. That doesn't seem to make too much sense. Uh, but the people who say, well, I'm going to start tithing as soon as I can afford it, guess what? They'll never afford it. They'll never give a tithe to God. There's a sixth problem with money and the love of money. It makes people, it keeps people from salvation. You know, oftentimes money keeps someone from being saved. In, in Luke chapter 18, Jesus told the story of a rich young ruler. A man came along, he wanted to follow Jesus. He had a lot of money and he loved his money. 
And uh, Jesus knew that he was covetous, that money was his master. He said, well, if you really want to follow me, uh, go give it all away. Get, sell it, give it to the poor. In Luke chapter 18, verse 23, it says, when he heard this, he was very sorrowful, for he was very rich. And when Jesus saw that he was very sorrowful, he said, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God, for it's easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Why, it's nigh unto impossible for a rich person to be saved. Now the disciples say, Well, then nobody rich can ever be saved. No, he said, With God anything's possible, but it sure is harder for people who love money to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Because, you see, they are so busy with their money, don't have time to think about God. Too proud to admit that they need the Lord. They can't take time for church. They can't take time for God. They're wrapped up in their money. Oh, and their money keeps them from salvation. The seventh problem with money. Money can make people proud. Go back to 1 Timothy chapter 6 again. Let's continue on there. 1 Timothy chapter 6. And go down to verse 17, where the apostle says, Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded. You warn those people who have money and things that they be not high-minded. That means proud. Oh, so easy for you. Oh, look at all the things I have. Look at all the things I can afford. And oftentimes that's why people spend money. It's just pride. To show off, to impress people. Look at the clothes I have. Look at the house I live in. Look at the car I drive. Look at me. See what I can buy. And the love of money ruins many lives, many homes. Now money is not bad. The love of it is bad. Money is not bad, but it's dangerous. There's a fourth principle involved in money, and that is Money cannot be trusted. Money cannot be trusted. Don't put your faith in your money. Notice in verse uh, 18 or verse uh, 17. Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches but in the living God. Don't put your confidence in your money or what you can buy with your money. Why not? Because you can't depend on it. Your money may be gone. There are problems that money can't solve for you, no matter how much you have. And you need to learn, we need to learn to depend on God and not on money and the credit card. Money can't be trusted. It will not solve your problems. It will not make you happy. And it will not guarantee anything for you. Don't trust money. A fifth principle, be generous with your money. Chapter 6, verse 18, he says, Warn these people who have money and things that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate. Paul says, Timothy, exhort people, remind them if they have money, be generous with it. Help out with it. Do good with it. And share it with others who are in need. Help others. Now, I don't mean help lazy people. God says, that's not a good idea. Uh, I don't mean give money to people that throw it away. That's not a wise investment. But when there are people in need, maybe they've got medical bills, maybe there are college students struggling to get through college, maybe there's a young couple trying to get started in life, maybe there's a missionary, a Christian school student, uh, there's plenty of needs around. And those are opportunities. If you have some, you can help. Help people, be generous to those in need. Jesus said, with the same measure that you meet, it shall be measured to you. In other words, if you are generous with others, God's going to be generous with you. And again, Jesus said, it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. Oh, I trust you believe that and practice that. There's a sixth principle in this passage, and that is, uh, our money should be used to lay up treasures in heaven. Money should be used to lay up treasures in heaven. Look at verse 19. He's telling Timothy to exhort people about this. Uh, 
uh, giving generously. It says, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to get eternal life by giving money away. No, but uh, uh, you lay hold on the blessings of eternal life as you give and lay up a store uh, in heaven for the times to come. Uh, Jesus said to the rich young ruler, uh, uh, give what you have away and you will have treasures in heaven. Now, do you really believe that? Do people really literally believe that what we give will gain us rewards in heaven? And do you believe that being generous and giving stores up eternal rewards for you in heaven? Well, I think if you believe that, you'd give as much as you could. I would think so. Uh, my goal has always been to give away as much as possible because that's a good thing to do. That gains great rewards in heaven. Not that we just give for that, but that's the result. And uh, how God's work would flourish, and how missions would prosper, how Christian schools would be established stronger uh, if God's people really believed in laying up treasures in heaven. So then, what do you do if your finances are in a mess? Well, stop spending money you don't have. Uh, only get those things that are necessary. But pay off your bills. Start with the smallest ones and pay them all off. Don't spend money, pay off your bills. And give the Lord his tithe. Ask the Lord for self-control. So you don't just buy whatever you want or whatever your children want. And keep your money and material things in perspective. Realize how little they really do and how uncertain they are. And do as much good for God with your money as you can. Oh, just those simple principles can straighten out your finances and make them right before God. But the most important is not the condition of your checkbook, but the condition of your eternal soul. That's what counts, really. In the long run, long after the things you've bought will be nothing but a pile of ashes, long after the money you've made will be all gone, long after that, you'll still be, be in eternity somewhere. And do you know what it is to know the Lord is your Savior? Have you been born again by work of God in your heart? If not, you need to turn from your sins, repent of your sins, put your faith in Christ. He's the one who died on the cross to save you. And his eternal life is not something you can buy with money, but it gives you as a gift. For God so loved the world that he gave, he gave his only begotten son, the greatest thing he had, and so that whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. Are you saved? Are you walking with God? Are you trusting the Lord to lead you and provide for you? Oh, keep money in perspective. Use it wisely, control it carefully, and make it a blessing for others. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace, your goodness. Lord, we pray that Christ might be exalted, that you might guide and watch over. We know, Lord, many of your people oftentimes are, uh, are hurting. They're just scrimping, by, getting by. Give them your grace and strength. Provide for their needs. And help us, Lord, to be faithful to you in all that we have. That we might not love it, we might not uh, hoard it or covet it, it uh, but use it for your glory and trust you for your provisions day by day. Uh, so bless, Lord, through these principles of Scripture, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Take your hymnals, turn with me to number 366. Let's realize our real position. We are heirs of God, children of the King.